Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second webcast of Turkaz Lab. During these programs, we are trying to talk about polarization uh, with scholars and uh, different disciplines. Today, our guest, James Drakman from Northwestern University, joined us. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. We are very happy to invite you. Thanks for accepting our invitation, actually. So um, if it's fine, I, I, can, I would like to start with my first question. Um, as you know that we observe effective polarization and the way po it portrays itself in social spaces is becoming deeper and actually it's becoming more widespread. So uh, you are already familiar with different studies and cases. As Turkaz Lab, we also conducted a survey in Turkey and our findings indicate that 75% of participants would not want their children marrying with supporters of their the most distant political party supporters. And if I need to give one more example, I, I can say 60% of individuals determined they would not want others as a neighbor. So individuals consider political party differences and actually people do not prefer to do business with their others or they do not want their children to play with others children who are uh, supportive of different political parties. So the division, I mean, there is a social division beyond ideological differences and it's becoming more visible in different societies. What would you think on the risks of effective polarization in societies? Yeah, thank you for that question and, and kind of sharing that that very interesting and, and concerning data. Um, yeah, I, I think that there are, there are kind of two aspects to which data like that would cause one to be concerned. Um, one is simply um, kind of the kind of the, the circular path of sorts that that is generating. So in some sense, you have to ask where is a, th those kinds of effective polarized attitudes coming from? And one of those dynamics is often a social processes of social sorting where people um, from groups that used to be, people used to um, have different types of relationships across different conflicting cleavages. Those types of cleavages are now starting to align with one another and so they're becoming reinforcing. And so the, within a particular party, there's less heterogeneity within the party. And that leads people to then view the other parties, particularly those that are more distant from themselves as kind of a mega, mega identity, um, kind of a thing that encapsulates everything that they don't like because they think that, that that other party is homogenous and very different from themselves. And so therefore they start to engage in this process of social distancing where they don't wanna have interactions with those from the other party. The problem then becomes that those become self-reinforcing insofar as they stop interacting with people from the other party. And then that contributes further to their stereotypes of the other party because they're not actually meeting people from the other party. And then they think the party is more and more different from themselves. They also are then um, isolating themselves from getting different perspectives on things. So they start to kind of have their own perspective on things, which can lead to um, kind of the second concern, which is you can start to have a bit of a, of a, um, a sense that um, a false consensus effect whereby you think that your views are kind of the views that everybody holds other than these other, other kind of fringe parties that are different than yourself. Um, and then that can kind of lead to a very difficult political situation where you have parties that are um, not engaging with one another and kind of competing with one another in ways that are um, not substantively based and based simply in kind of their lack of interaction. And then ultimately that creates a, a challenge for democracy um, insofar as we think that pluralism is typically a good for democracy. And so and pluralism is based in a lot of having cross cutting cleavages. But if these, um, if cleavages are no longer cross cutting across parties and parties start to become very homogenous and they're not interacting with one another, then that undermines the pluralism that often can lead um, to, to kind of stability in democracy. Since you mentioned about uh, cleavages, I can continue with this uh, point actually, because I mean, different contexts bring uh, various consequences in societies. For instance, we 
uh, we experienced extraordinary conditions with COVID-19 and its impact uh, created new questions in our lives. For instance, we try to protect ourselves from COVID. So it brings the issue of protection from uh, pandemics or it brought issues to reach vaccine, vaccination or opportunities, disadvantages for vaccination, inequality between rich and poor countries. In other words, widening the gap between developed and underdeveloped countries or the divide between those privileged enough to be vaccinated and those who cannot. So these kind of issues surrounded with the existence of the uh, pandemic. So uh, during this period, of course, while we were experiencing these extraordinary conditions, political leaders and specifically the right wing populists, they were not able to deal with it. Uh, for, uh, they tr they underestimated in the beginning then actually we saw painful experiences, especially in Brazil, India, but of course not only in these countries. And this uh, COVID and when we talk about its impacts and consequences, we can talk about one uh, important danger. Uh, which is partisanship and misinformation about COVID-19, which are highly dominant around the world. How would you evaluate the contribution of misinformation and pandemics towards polarization? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think COVID-19 was really a, a kind of a very sad test case for the, the, the reach of effective polarization, because when effective polarization, or I'm sorry, when COVID-19 first emerged as a pandemic, I, I think a lot of the hope was, you know, particularly, I know this for, for sure in the United States, was that this would somehow unify across partisan lines and that we would kind of, polarization would be tamped down a little bit. Um, you know, historically, again, you know, my in, in the U.S., I know, for example, after 9-11, for example, um, there, was, there was kind of cross-partisan support. Um, you saw the same thing in the U.S. after Osama bin Laden was, was, was captured and, and killed. So these kind of existential threats um, often brings people together. And so there was this hope that COVID-19 would do the same thing. And of course, it, it, if anything, it did the opposite, um, not only in the US, but, but uh, you know, across the world. And I, I, I think a lot of that had to do with, with um, it became a partisan issue and your position on different issues surrounding COVID-19 became almost a partisan social signal of where you stood. Um, so. Um, if you supported more restrictive health guidelines, it meant you were taking a side with one party, whereas if you supported um, more opening up the economy, you were taking a side with another party. Um, and this carried through all kinds of beliefs, including factual beliefs about the extent of COVID-19. And so again, I, you know, I know in, in the US, you saw kind of vast um, informational differences or, or beliefs across the parties um, based on kind of their, their beliefs. Um, and you kind of saw this on, on both sides. So for example, early in the pandemic, you saw Republicans were very apt to believe that, this, that COVID was um, an explicit attack um, launched on the United States by China. Um, and you know, at, at that time, there was no evidence supporting that. Um, whereas you saw Democrats um, kind of were in, in, in embracing other types of beliefs um, particularly what we found in some of our work was that they were likely to think that getting a flu vaccine would help be an effective antidote to COVID-19, um, which of course it, it wasn't. Um, and a lot of these beliefs seem to be grounded in social signaling that you were part of one party or another. Now, of course, the hope would be that the reality constraints, you know, the reality of COVID-19 and kind of the health consequences of COVID-19 would bring people into a, a common space of seeing some kind of an objective reality. And that that didn't seem to happen, at least not to the extent that, that many of us may have expected it to happen, I think is a, it reveals the, the real potential dangers um, of effective polarization, um, that people would, would go so far to put their own health in jeopardy um, in order to protect a, a partisan identity. Um, and so I, I think it was a, you know, it's been a very sad statement about the, the potential consequences. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have one more question. Uh, I think 
I mean, I, I, I'm going to uh, give some examples, but maybe you can generalize in terms of the relationship between populism and uh, polarization. So uh, we have various cases such as uh, the United States with the former president, Donald Trump, or uh, we already mentioned some countries like Brazil with Bolsonaro and Modi. So their populist language articulates polarization, and these actors have Yes, they have different aspects because there is no single populism that reflects variety of populist uh, reactions. However, they also in, um, demonstrate some commonalities in each other. Considering the last elections of the United States, we can argue that the existence of um, polarization is very influential in the society. I mean. Trump's voting rate was not very low when we uh, consider the results. Uh, but also I, I want to focus on the last elections in Paris, very new uh, case. A former less leftist, leftist uh, teacher Castillo won the elections by 50% and his rival was Fujimori. So we heard some nicknames. I think these nicknames have different meanings in society, such as a professor who was leading for a strike in 2017. This is an important point because the other camp actually instrumentalized this. During the electoral uh, campaign, the other side was using a slogan in billboards highlighting communism is coming. Actually, it was kind of a tool or let's say act to demonize the other camp. So then Castillo won the elections even with the criminalization against him. But we know that the country is divided. So, um, I mean, can you please explain and share your opinions on these kind of conditions? I mean, when I say conditions, it means that two camps and populism, because it creates the deeper sense of us and them distinction. For instance, in Peru, the first block is uh, repre represented by Castillo and maybe anti-polarizing language, but also populism. And the second block has support of, uh, for, it represents the support for Fujimori, kind of populist and clientelist camp. Would the division between Castillo and Fujimori cause further polarization by populism? Or maybe you can consider in, in more general sense, would the division or populism cause further polarization? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I think it's hard to say, you know, there has to be a basis for some polarization at, at some point, and usually it emerges from political elites at the start. Um, and there's, some, there's something that the political elites have to glom onto in order to kind of differentiate themselves and then that differentiation becomes greater and greater. And populism obviously is, is, is proven to be a pretty effective way for politicians to differentiate themselves. And so it can contribute to, popul um, to polarization quite clearly. I think the real danger, um, I'm, 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 I'm unsure if, if that contributes more to polarization or not than other types of rhetorical approaches. But I think what it does do is that it, it, it represents a, a greater danger for the polarization that is existing. Because what populism does, or the type of populism that we're seeing today is kind of enfranchising people um, who feel like they have been, you know, what populism is by definition, it's kind of enfranchising people against elites of some type or another. Um, but what they're, how it's being kind of operationalized in practice is kind of op enfranchising people almost against the state itself or against expertise itself. Um, and so I think that becomes particularly troubling insofar as you end up with people who believe that they are taking populist stands, but the populist stands are against the basic institutions of democracy um, or of expertise. Um, and, and I think we saw some of this through COVID-19. Um, we certainly saw, again, you know, coming back to in, in the US, we saw the, the um, kind of the, the vilification in some sense of the, the health establishment by the Republican party, um, who kind of was very dismissive of scientists and, and kind of scientists were even ridiculed um, by President Trump, then President Trump at the time. And that was kind of all in the name of a type of populism. Um, so this type of populism that undermines the state itself, I, I think can be extremely damaging. Um, you know, at a very kind of low level, it can be damaging insofar as people then do not have any trust in government unless 
Um, it's being run by the people that they're supporting. Um, but then it becomes even more dangerous insofar as it opens the door for democratic backsliding because people start to not trust basic democratic norms because they feel that those norms um, are no longer protecting the people. Um, so they don't, they don't believe that the election, they don't believe the election outcomes anymore because they think the elections are being run by elites and it's a populist stance to say, oh, you know, we can't trust this, um, they're against us. And so for, therefore we're not gonna, we're gonna abide by the election outcome. Um, and you know, that was kind of, again, what's been going on in the United States on one side. Um, so I think coming back to your question, I think it's an excellent question, the extent to which populism itself exacerbates polarization. And I, I think that that's, that's a really important question. Um, I, I think that's one to think about. I think what it does do very clearly is it makes polarization around populist ideals, the way it's been done in, in, in contemporary times, particularly dangerous in opening the door for um, anti-democratic tendencies um, that could, you know, have very severe consequences for, for, for countries and, and governance and, and ultimately, um, you know, do exactly the opposite of what populists think they might be doing. Um, they're not going to, they might end up empowering not people, um, but, but potentially um, um, authoritarian elements. Um, and so I think in that sense, uh, you know, populism has been a little bit turned on its head um, from, from what, 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 what I think people perhaps um, think it might be doing. Um, and so, so I think it's, the confluence of populism with polarization um, is a really concerning trend um, right now um, throughout the world. So we talked about some issues, but in every podcast and webcast uh, for our projects, I try to conclude with hope. Maybe you can also show a way for hope as well. Um, yeah. Can you share your opinions on strategies and some, maybe you, you can give recommendations to mitigate polarization? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I'm excited to, I'm, I'm really happy you asked that. And I'm excited that I, I think a lot of, um, scholars and practitioners um, have been working on, on that type of question. Um, you know, I think at a basic psychological level, you know, the key to kind of having groups get along with one another is have them um, not stereotype one another. And so one way to kind of avoid that type of stereotypes would be to have more interaction between groups. But of course that comes back to the very first question that you asked insofar as if people are no longer even um, socializing with people from other parties um, that could have serious political consequences. Um, so those social, those social manifestations of polarization can be, become problematic. But I think a solution is to encourage more of that kind of cross-party dialogue um, through socialization processes. So even early on um, in, in, in kind of amongst young people and socializing. And then I think kind of along those lines of kind of preventing stereotypes, I, I think a really large driver of polarization is misperceptions of what the other side is. Um, so, right, I think there are now a number of research studies that have shown that people perceive the other side to be a lot more extreme, a lot more engaged, a lot more obstructionist, um, a lot more um, de dehumanizing even um, than they actually are. Um, so people kind of start to create this um, very ugly um, perception in their mind of what the other side looks like. And so if we can just find a way to kind of correct those misperceptions, um, then I think that could go a long way. The, the trick is, it's a little bit hard to correct the misperceptions because a lot of those are coming from some of the, the, you know, the dynamics that you talked about at the beginning, and then also coming from social media um, itself, which I, I think has contributed somewhat to, to the polarization. And so far as who we see talking about politics on social media are not the modal members of the other party, but they're the extreme members of the other party. And so that contributes to it. So it's a little bit difficult on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's not a difficult thing to do. Like we know what we need to do. Um, we just need to kind of somehow figure out how to communicate that. And I think trying to do that kind of um, as, a, as a socializing mechanism is one approach. Another approach is try to work with media organizations. Um, media organizations right, to, like, like to kind of broadcast conflict. And so they like to put on the extremes of each of the sides um, to the extent that um, different organizations can instead start to, to kind of put more weight on kind of um, moderating pictures or kind of more modal pictures of interactions between the different parties. Um, you know, I think that can make a big difference. Um, so I, I, I do have some hope um, 
insofar as the more that we can learn about people from the other party, I think, that, or other parties, um, the, le the more I think we can kind of overcome polarization. Um, so I think, I think we know what we have to do. It's in the abstract, it shouldn't be that hard to do. So the trick is to kind of try to figure out in practice to get people to kind of take that leap to kind of actually try to learn about the other side a, a, a little bit more and correct the misperceptions that they're walking around with. So maybe more contact and if people know what we need to know, because we already know some things or we can discover it with differences. So we will overcome with this kind of uh, polarization. So thanks for your all answers. In a, I mean, it's, it was very informing and it was very comprehensive. It was very nice to hear from you. And again, thanks for accepting our invitation. Yeah, thank you for doing such an important project. So thank for having me. Thank you. Today we are concluding our webcast, but I should emphasize that we will continue with new guests. Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you.